Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and uh, I'm actually really busy, so I just want to make a quick update to kind of collect together a bunch of important things that have happened. Uh, so this is mostly going to be freestyled. I don't know how much graphics there's going to be, but uh, hopefully you'll get all the cool information. And the coolest thing, or the most interesting thing, I guess, is they had a press conference today about uh, Crew-1, which is, of course, SpaceX launching Crew to the space station in November. The date for that is now November 14th. If they launch on that date, they will be able to rendezvous with the space station in eight and a half hours. They have other backup dates, but that's the time that is the best option. However, before they do that, they have to show that the Falcon booster is working fine. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a problem with Falcon 9 launching GPS satellites. Uh, the count countdown went down to two seconds, the engine started igniting and then the computer aborted the liftoff because there was excessive pressure in the um, gas generator on a couple of the engines. So they finally figured out what's gone on with this. The, the parts have, well the parts had a relief valve which was clogged and they've had to take the engines off that rocket, get them cleaned and they're replacing them. So. Let's just go into exactly what's going on here. So in the engines, there is the gas generator, which is like a miniature rocket motor, which runs very fuel rich, so it's cooler. That drives a turbine, which drives the pumps, hence turbo pumps. So when the engines start up, this is like the first place where combustion happens. So they pressurize the system, fuel and oxygen flow in, and then the starting fluid, T-TEB, right, is supposed to go in and that's supposed to start the combustion, that, you know, start your engines. What happened was the, the sensor saw that there was too much pressure in the gas generator already, implying that it was too much oxygen and uh, uh, RP1. Therefore, it didn't trigger the ignition and stopped everything. Well, so they took the engines off the rocket, sent them up to McGregor, and they ran them through the test. And again, they found out that this startup was happening too quickly, so uh, the engines weren't starting properly. They took the engines apart. Actually, no, they put them into a CAT scanner first, right? So they, you know, of course, bombard them with radiation and produce a, an image, and they saw there was something in a place where it shouldn't be. Took the engine apart, and they found out that a relief valve line, which was about one and a half millimeters uh, across and about you know, 12 millimeters long or uh, about one sixteenth of an inch wide and half an inch long. It was clogged with a red lacquer and they traced this to the anodizing process they use on uh, aluminium parts. So anodizing is a surface treatment process that you use on aluminium to give the, to make the surface more corrosion proof or whatever. And when you're doing that, you might have a part where you need to use different uh, you know, surface finishes on different parts of it. So when you're processing one part, you will cover the other section with a protective layer. And in this case, the company that did it had this you know, red lacquer that was applied. They performed the anodizing and then they're supposed to clean that off. And it looks like during the cleaning, the lacquer was dissolved, flew into this channel which was blocked and the engine would light sometimes, so, and clearly then it didn't when they put it on the rocket and attempted to launch with it. So SpaceX have identified this problem. They've identified other engines that had this problem, the, um, which were gonna be on the Crew-1 booster, and I believe the Sentinel-6 booster, which is gonna be going out of Vandenberg on November 4th, uh, that also had it. So they're taking these engines off and replacing them with good engines while they clean them and verify them that they're working. So that's good news. So the NASA wants to see GPS-3 launch correctly on this booster to show that the booster's fine. If that goes ahead on schedule, then we can expect this November 14th date to hold, and that will be the first operational crew mission to the space station on a Dragon uh, spacecraft, which will be great. Okay, elsewhere, um, over the weekend, of course, we were all talking about OSIRIS-REx. Um, OSIRIS-REx had too much stuff in its sample container. We've just seen photos that they have successfully placed the sample container face down inside the, um, the return capsule. So that's good. They're doing a bunch of, they've done this very slowly. They're verifying that everything's working, but it's looking like they have everything sealed in place and 
were everything's going well. So good news on that front. Uh, oh, another thing about SpaceX, by the way, is the first beta test for Starlink is starting up. We've obviously had a couple of other Starlink launches recently, but uh, the num that means we get to see some of the numbers. If you want to get Starlink service, the beta is charging $500 for the special antenna, which, you know, you stick on your roof and it uses a uh, phased array antenna to talk to satellites, multiple satellites, etc. Uh, it will give you between 50 and 150 megabits per second, I believe, on of service. But because the network is not fully complete, because they haven't got all their satellites up, this will vary a lot and there may be times when you do not have any service. On top of the antenna, it'll be $100 per month. So yeah, depending upon where you are and what your options are, this might be an amazing deal or it might be not as good as what you already have. I'm paying $200 a month for a gigabit. So yeah, I mean, that obviously doesn't work for me, but there are certainly, I'm in a pretty urban area, so to speak. I mean, sure, you know, I've got forests next to me, but I walk down the street and there's, you know, major towns and stuff there. Um, so yeah, depending upon where you are, this might be a great thing. But it's interesting that we're now actually starting to see the price. And so depending upon how many people adopt this, we'll get to see whether this is really a moneymaker for SpaceX. Um, the other big NASA story was something that surprised exactly nobody. Uh, on Monday, they, well... Early or last week, they basically said, we're going to have a great press conference about the moon and Sophia, the, the you know, the stratospheric observatory for infrared ob uh, astronomy, um, which is basically a plane with a telescope in it. And I have a great video I made about that of, uh, last year. So they said, we're going to have a press conference about it. And everyone said, oh, it's going to be another press conference announcing water on the moon because... I mean, God, everybody knew. I mean, seriously, we sort of looked through the various proposals that had been submitted to Sophia because all this is public. And we saw there was only one about the moon and it was looking for water on the moon. Um, but yeah, what, what have they found? So previously, the evidence that has come for water from the moon uh, by, via remote sensing has mainly been we've seen hydrogen or we've seen hydroxyl ions. So hydroxyl ions is basically hydrogen and an oxygen missing the extra hydrogen part. So now looking in the six micron range using Sophia, which can get above the, you know, most of the water in the atmosphere, they were able to unambiguously detect evidence of a, tra you know, of a transition line that corresponded to molecular oxygen. So this is the first spectroscopic detection of actual water rather than water adjacent molecules. They believe, well, what they said was the amount corresponds to about 300 milliliters or a can of soda spread across a football field. So <laughs> this is not a huge amount of uh, water in it. I mean, based on their estimates, if you dug up like a couple of tons of lunar dirt, you might be able to get a soda can worth of stuff. I, I, I think Alex Parker said it best when it was not too much water for homeopathy, not enough to make rocket fuel. Certainly, though, it, what was really actually the, the thing I forgot to say here is that this was discovered in Clavius Crater. This was in broad daylight. And as you know, the temperatures on the surface of the moon are like 230 centigrade. It's you're going to cook anything there. These are water molecules, but it's not like liquid water on the surface of the moon. This is water molecules that might be fixed to the surface of dust grains or are, are trapped inside uh, glassy you know, pieces of lunar glass. So it's great that we show that there are certainly more ways for water to get on there. It's not going to be a source of material of, uh, for ISRU unless, well, maybe it turns out there's a lot more of it on the shady parts of the moon. But still, it's a pretty cool bit of research to actually get this uh, data in. I love Sophia. It's a, it's a telescope that does a lot of things. And I, I find it sad that it's not flying as much as it should because it doesn't get the budget it should. And everybody just te keeps trying to cancel it. You know, it, going back over a decade, presidents and you know, NASA administrators have frequently you know, cut the funding for Sophia, but I think it's a fine instrument that does stuff that nobody else can do. Assuming 
you let it fly often enough to really you know, make it do all that. Yeah. So I think that is all the things that I wanted to talk about. And I've managed to clock in this in at 10 minutes. No, well, that's not bad. So, <laughs> so anyway, yes, we're looking forward to uh, SpaceX flying again. We're looking forward to uh, the capsule being closed on Osiris Rex. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.